how much do you think you're paying in subscriptions every month? The answer is probably more than you think. Over 74% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you'll have a clear view of your subscriptions, and if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. They'll even try to negotiate lower bills for you by up to 20%. Just submit a picture of your bill, and they'll take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash helpmesave. That's rocketmoney.com slash helpmesave. rocketmoney.com slash helpmesave. Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. In 2017, I received a big check from my previous employer, invested it in a locked-in RRSP, and today I beat the market by 2.5% annually ever since. Want to know what's inside my portfolio and how I manage it? Today's episode is all about that. Hello investors, bonjour. This is Mike Yeru, founder of Dividend Stocks Rocks and passionate investor. You're listening to the Dividend Guy Blog podcast where I and my co-host Veronique will help you invest with more conviction so you can enjoy your retirement. Good investors, bonjour. Mike Yeru here. You're listening to the Dividend Guy podcast. I hope you are doing well. Um, today, last episode of the year, right, Vero? So kind of kind of crazy how fast it went again in 2023. <laughs> I know it's a cliche, but damn, I, I, I just can't believe that we're already done with this I'm, year. I'm on the same page as you, Mike. I just thought the same thing when I prepared the episode. I was like, oh my God, already the last one of 2023. And what a year, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, Mike, uh, did you make any personal resolutions for the new year? Well, you know me, it's like not about one or two, but I have like a long list. Actually, it's like, it's it's longer than my list for Santa Claus, actually. So I don't know what's wrong with me, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm someone that, uh, that needs a lot of projects, um, to, to keep going. So, um, on the, uh, on the health side, I want to keep running a uh, hundred K per month. So, uh, goal of like 1200. Uh, two years ago when I did the Kilimanjaro, well, last year I did it, but this year I completely failed. So that's why it's back on my list for next year. I mean, I ran like a little bit over 1000, which is not that bad, but, mm -hmm. uh, not enough to my taste. So anyways, got to do that. Uh, do a little more weightlifting. So I got to keep up in shape. And one thing I want to add this year is I want to reduce my number of cheat days because I <laughs> try to eat well, which is usually derailed like three or four times a week. So it's not, <laughs> it's not that great. So my meals are good, but I always have like some extras on the side and, and I'm, 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 like my goal this year is to cut on the those extras because definitely is uh it's that's not helping. I mean I'm I'm running, I'm doing the workout, but I mean there's no point of doing all of that effort if it's to get like half like half of the year in cheat days. Mm -hmm. Not really realistic. Um one thing that I love that I did in 23 is I um I went on a small weekend just with my wife. We rented a uh a vacation property up in the mountain for like 2 days and that was just amazing. So 
for 24, I want to do more weekend getaways, like maybe three or four throughout the years. Um, I'm already traveling a lot, but just doing this with my wife only, um, that was like amazing. And as like children are growing older, it's easier to do. Mm -hmm. So that's also on my list. And obviously I have like, a bunch of projects for 2024 for the business. Uh, I'm not going to disclose them today, but I'd like to grow the business by another 50%. So you better 50%. get ready. 50%. <laughs> yeah, 50. Yeah. I mean, you know, because 15 was too small. So I said, yeah, instead of 15, let's go to 50%. <laughs> okay. So now I know what I'm, what I'll be busy at next year. Definitely. Uh, I'll work on the growth part for DSR. <laughs> um, but Mike, you what know, about you, Vay? Do you have like anything in mind now? Well, um, you just made me uh, think about something because, you know, in 2023, I didn't talk about it that much, but I started e eating differently and I started doing some like biking every morning and um, I lost 15 pounds so far. Wow, and that's I amazing. Feel, yeah, and I feel much better. So that's a win for me. And also, you know, I, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but um, I moved in in a new house and I'm really happy about that. So that was like a long time uh, goal that I've just reached in 2023. So now what will happen in 2024? Well, <laughs> uh, keep on going for, for those two things. And also, um, I'm not sure if the end result will, will happen in 2024, but I do want to take motorcycle lessons in order to nice. buy a Harley Davidson. So yeah, that's, that's something I was dreaming about when I was a teenager. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if it's the fact that I turned 40 uh, in October, but yeah, um, the dream is back. There's a the crisis side. coming up, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably it. And, you know, the reason why uh, there's no date set uh, is because I didn't sit down and budget the whole thing yet, which I know you're not going to be proud of. And this <laughs> is why we are here today. Not for my motor motorcycle goal, but to show investors how taking some time to reflect on their portfolio yearly helps them stay focused and take the best decisions possible. So to do so, uh, we'll look at your pension plan portfolio, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's uh, it's one thing. I mean, I do this reflection throughout the holidays because it's a calm thing, calm moment for me, but it's not necessarily like the moment that would fit anybody else like schedule. So it's, it's more about finding a time in your year where you can cut down that noise and just take a few days to reflect on your portfolio. And that's, that's what I've been doing for the past like two months, but more intensively over the past two weeks. So before we start, listeners, I have to let you know that we will have an entire series on how to invest in 2024 next week. So from January 1st to January 5th, we'll publish an episode a day to help investors achieve their goals. So please hit pause and subscribe to the show now not to miss it. Oh uh, yeah, last year we had an amazing success doing so and we are coming back with a combo where we're going to have not only one episode a day on the podcast but also one video per day on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So if if you're if you're off, if you're like wondering what to do the first week of January, I think we're going to get yourself pretty booked. <laughs> So um, just search for Dividend Guy on YouTube and you'll find um, our channel for sure. All right, Mike. So you often mention on this show that you review your portfolio quarterly, but how is the yearly update different to you and why is it important? Um, yeah. So let's start with the quarterly review, which is relatively fast, I would say. And, and the goal for the quarterly review is more to take some mental note of how my portfolio is shaping and where the companies are going. So I'm just like looking it's like, okay, so I might be a little bit overweight in this sector or this company is starting to be a little bit too important and just stuff like that. But I don't want to be trigger happy. I don't want to rebalance my portfolio every quarter because on the market, it, it, it goes fast 
and and sometimes you would be tempted to take action for one quarter, but if you wait just two three weeks later, you're gonna notice that everything is back to normal, and and what was like way too high is going back down or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the goal is not just to multiple the transaction, but more getting ready for that financial review where then I, I, I will sit down and, and go like line by line, making sure that everything works well. And then all the mental notes I've taken throughout the year, then it's time to take decisions. So it's a process that helps me keeping my emotion away. So whether I'm upset, I'm frustrated, I panic or anything, well, if I have to wait until the end of the year to make my transaction, like there's only just the rationality that will be left and no more emotion. So that's one thing. And the other mm -hmm. thing is also the goal is to do some tweaking and not necessarily to sell half of the portfolio because it was a bad year or, mm -hmm. or to double down on all the stocks that I love just because they've been doing so well or trying to dollar cost average on the other side. It's really about improving the portfolio just bits by bits. I mean, technically I should have done my, my homework a while ago and this should do well already. Mm -hmm. And, and it's not, it's not a time to make rash decision. That's for sure. So for the benefit of our listeners who might do a yearly update for, uh, for the first time, which tools and metrics do you use to pull out your results? Well, The only tool I use, and I know it's a shameless plug, but this is why I built it. It's the DSR Pro Report. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the thing is, um, with Dividend Stocks Rock uh, Pro Dashboard, I get all the information I want in terms of asset allocation, the sector, the stock, the ratings. Um, I can pull out the report where I, I can read the latest quarterly uh, press release as well. So I got really all the information I need. And to calculate my returns, I like to keep things simple because, of course, you can build a huge Excel spreadsheet um, entering all the time that you add capital or all the time that you withdraw capital. But for me, it would be just time consuming for nothing. So I rather just look at the number at the beginning of the year, the number at the end of the year, and then I just adjust for the capital that was either coming in or going out. But that's pretty much it. So I get just the numbers from my brokerage account and, and it's more than enough or they're actually, I can even get them from DSR Pro. So I don't even have to look into my, my DSR Pro account. And, and those are the numbers I need to make my, my full review. And whenever I look, I want to look at specific metrics. While we do have all those stock cards with more than like 40 or 50 financial metrics inside mm -hmm. each of the stock cards at DSR. So if I want to dig a little bit deeper, it's really easy with a couple of clicks to do a deep dive and analyze some graphs as well because we do have like plenty of graphs with 10 years of history so i don't really need anything else but my dsr pro report when it's time to make decisions about my portfolio but then do you compare the results with a benchmark and if so which one do you use um yes i i think it's uh it's a good idea to know where you're doing um compared to the market but not just to compare to, uh, against the market but rather say well if the entire market is down it's kind of normal that your portfolio is not doing that great so it's also a, a way to understand that well if you're down 10 and you look at the canadian market and the u.s market and both of them are also down double digit Well, there was not much that you could do that here. Mm -hmm. So in terms of benchmark, uh, some people could use an ETF that is in line with their strategy. So for me, I could pick um, a Canadian and a US uh, ETF geared towards dividend growers. Uh, the, the idea to do that would be to say, well, am I better saving a lot of times and just paying a small fee to get the same strategy? But personally, I prefer to uh, match my my uh, my portfolio returns against the XIU, which tracks the TSX uh, 60, and SPY um, that tracks the S&P 500. So I do my portfolio is roughly 50% Canadian, 50% US. So I do an average of those two ETF to say to see what happened on the stock market versus what uh, what happens in my portfolio. So, Mike, what is the most important to you? Is it 
beating your benchmark or beating your own previous results? Well, the thing is, you can't, you cannot always, I mean, we all wish that when we invest every single year is better than the last one, but mm -hmm. it's not always the case, unfortunately. <laughs> like in 2022, it was very hard to actually be in positive territories. Uh, besides those who had invested massively in the energy sector, that was pretty much the only place where you could generate some interesting returns. Mm -hmm. So looking at like one year over year, not that important for me. Um, actually, even when I look at the benchmark and I always do it because I think it's like for accountability, it's also important. I report this, uh, my pension plan account um, results monthly on the Dividend Guy blog. And the reason why I do that is for transparency and just to show the journey like months after months. Now it's been since 2017. So it's been like what, like six years, six full years mm -hmm. uh, now that I'm doing this. And, and what I love the most about it is just to show how a portfolio geared towards dividend growth investing, where I cannot add capital because it's a locked in account. So there's only like I cannot add account money, I cannot withdraw money from it at this point. So the only results are being supported by capital gains and dividend payments. There's mm -hmm. nothing else. So I cannot just say, oh yeah, my portfolio is up like $100,000 and I added $120,000. <laughs> so that's why it's up 100. So it's easy to say, right? So mm -hmm. the those are like easy returns to calculate, which is also fun to, and, and it's 100% transparent. Um, on the other side, I would not freak out if one year I do not beat the market. So overall, over the past six years, I've been able to um, to do some pretty strong results. So at the uh, at the time of recording, we use the results as of November 29th. And my portfolio was up 111% versus the, the amount that I've received in September of 2017 um, for an annualized growth rate of 12.72, so almost 13%. Mm -hmm. If I look at the um, uh, S&P uh, 500, that was up 104, so almost the same thing as mine, but keep in mind that mine is like 50% Canadian. And the Canadian market was up 63.9, so 64%. For an average of, if, like if we do like a 50-50 average on an mm -hmm. annual growth rate basis, it's like 10.26. So beating the market annually by 2.5% is a huge added value. But again, my goal here is more about making sure that my my hobby, my passion is not destroying my portfolio mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than than trying to beat the market as like every single year. Most of the time it happens. Like this year I'm way ahead of the market, which is great. But in the end, the point here is is just to make sure that I do not damage the portfolio. It's pretty much like with your future Harley Davidson, I'm pretty sure that you're not going to start um, pulling out like your ratchets and start playing around with the with the engine, and you you probably don't want to damage it. You just want to be be able to ride it nicely mm -hmm. and surely. <laughs> Like you, you've noticed, I've mentioned the lessons first because you know, <laughs> I don't know how to drive one. So yeah, totally right about that. Um, <laughs> so Mike, basically the results are one thing, but understanding them is better. And to do so, you look at different aspects of your portfolio. For each, you'll take notes on decisions that might be taken, right? Yes. So as I said, I will look at my portfolio quarterly that will help me get into full control and remember everything that is happening in my portfolio. Uh, and and one, one thing that would help me if I have like 75 stocks, I would realize that it's almost impossible or not as interesting as I thought to follow 75 companies every quarter. So that would be a big red flag telling me maybe I need to... Um, short that list a little bit, sell some assets that are not that important in my portfolio, and then move on. Um, and, and the goal here is to always keep a, uh, a long-term mindset. So it's, it's pretty much when I was uh, planning with my, uh, my one-year trip in the RV, I knew that I left, I would, I would leave Montreal on June and get into Costa Rica on December 1st. 
and I had a pretty good idea where I wanted to go. But during the trip, you're going to make some adjustment. The most important part is to remember where you're supposed to be. So at one point, I was like, okay, so now it's time to go down a little bit. And then when, when we were like in California, we thought, well, now it's time to enter Mexico and so on. So we have to move on, get closer to the goal, but mm -hmm. one step at a time. And it's the same thing with the portfolio. So I want to I wanna rather stick to my process and create a balance across the asset allocation, the sector allocation, the stock allocation as well, just to make sure that I'm still in line with the long-term goal here, where is to reach the best total return possible for the long run. And I don't need that money for another 20 years easily. And even in 20 years, um, I'm not going to withdraw all of it. I'm just going to start withdrawing at one point. Mm -hmm. So again, it's really, I know that I'm going to go through a lot of bull uh, markets, a lot of bear markets again. So it's going to be like fulls of ups and downs. And my point is really to see what is working in my portfolio, see what is not working that much and, and, and determine if it's just a matter of like, oh, that's because the market reacted this way due to this event. So for example, in 23, um, as interest rate continues to rise, well, we had a lot of higher yielders that didn't do that well. So the classic um, the classic yielders, especially in Canada, so we're thinking about the Keenan banks, the telcos, the utilities, REITs, they're not doing that great. Why? Because a lot of income-seeking investors started to say, well, now I can get bonds at like 5, 5.5%, which is a lot better than investing in stocks, in my opinion, because there's no volatility and it's pretty stable and I just get the money that I'm looking for at retirement. So mm -hmm. all that money getting away from equities um, started to wait on the stock price and now they're down. So when you understand what's happening in the dynamic, now you're in a better position to determine if you want to keep investing in this sector or if you're just like, okay, I'm done. It's never going to come back and, and I just want to move over. So the goal here is really to look at the portfolio, look at what worked, what didn't work, and then try to make up your mind and, and have an explanation. And, and instead of just saying, oh my God, I'm losing 20% on that stock. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell because it's down 20%. Like, Ba like basing your decision just based on performance could lead to a lot of big mistakes. And many, many, many times we see a stock going down by 15, 20%. Maybe you just never realized it, but it happens all the time for a lot of companies. And it's not necessarily because they're bad stocks. It's just because that's the volatility of the market. Mm -hmm. All right, Mike, so you know me, I like to make things as clear as possible for uh, listeners. So we'll go into each aspect of your portfolio. Your asset allocation is the first thing to review. What conclusions can you make for your own pension plan? Yeah, so we start with a global view because the asset allocation will explain most of your returns. So obviously, mm -hmm. if you're all in bonds, well, you're going to have like, it's going to dictate what you're going to make in terms of returns. If you're all in stocks, the same thing. On my side, I've been 100% in equities since 2003. So it's been 20 years where I have the exact same asset allocation. We're so that's not going to change today. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy to follow, right? 100%. There you go. That's it. So if I have like uh, 0.20, 0.30% in cash, that's just like some dividends laying around that are mm -hmm. going to be invested pretty shortly. But that's about it. The um, other aspect that I use um, at DSR Pro is I look at the currency that I'm invested. So I have the US dollar and the Canadian dollar. I try to have a balance between both, but in my pension plan right now, the US portfolio is doing a lot better. So it's now at 59% versus 40, 41% for the Canadian portfolio, uh, for the Canadian part of my portfolio. Um, it's a bit on balance, 
But again, that is only one portfolio out of many that I have. So, I mean, you know, Canadians, we just like, life, like to have like plenty of accounts. So there's a TFSA, <laughs> there's my Smith Maneuver, there's a RESP, RRSP, and so on. So we all end up with like five or six different accounts. But when I look at the global view, which is available on the DSR Pro dashboard, I can see that my US portion is actually 52.75, so roughly 53% and 47% for Canadian. So at this point, I'm pretty on, in line with the balance I want 50-50. Like 3% is not going to make a big difference. If all my portfolios would have led to the same 59-41, 60-40, then I would have started to think, okay, I need to sell a, a, a few US assets, maybe trim a few position and bring that back into the Canadian dollar. Mm -hmm. Next step is the sector allocation. What's important for you when you look at your uh, sector pie chart? Uh, the most important part is to find balance. Uh, too often, if you start investing using a stock screener with specific metrics, you're going to find a bunch of companies in the same sector showing strong metrics. And that's normal because at any point in time, there's always one or two sectors that will do better than all the others. So those companies are surfing that wave, but there's no point of having seven companies in the same sector and then mm -hmm. invest like 40% of your portfolio in one single sector. Uh, last year, for example, if you were invested massively in technology stocks, uh, that would have been very hard for you because the, the, the sector went down by like 30% in general. So you don't necessarily want to have half your portfolio into one sector. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. So it's hard to know which sector is going to be better than others. So I'm trying to have some kind of balance. Mm -hmm. When I look at my pension plan portfolio, I'm overweight in two sectors. So the maximum I like to have in a specific sector is roughly 20%. Uh, again, just because I don't want to be overexposed to specific risk. But when I look at my portfolio, I'm at 29% in financial and 25% in technology stocks. So Above 50% in two sectors is definitely too much to my mm -hmm. taste. Uh, again, I have to put put that back in um, in the global view where I only have the tech stock at 26, but the financial sectors uh, goes below the bar of 20%. So it's not the end of the world. And I can live with that because I am well diversified within those two sectors. So if we go back to the pension plan at 29% in financials, what I like to see in my financial stocks is I have Brookfield Corporation, which is an asset manager, such as Black Rock, but BlackRock is um, all about the classic market with where Brookfield Corporation is an alternative asset manager. I mm -hmm. do have Visa, which is a payment processor, and I have two banks, National Bank and Royal Bank. So even though I have a good concentration of my portfolio in one sector, um, I am divided into three different industries. So imagine that there's a mortgage crisis in Canada not going to impact Visa, not going to impact BlackRock, and not going to impact Brookfield Corporation. So even if there's one major market event that will just affect one industry, but not the entire sector because I'm well diversified. Mm -hmm. The story would have been quite different if I had six Canadian banks and nothing else. Because then if there's a mortgage crisis, I'm going to get hit like a baseball bat in my face. That is for sure. And this is not what you want, especially during the holidays. That would that would suck a lot. <laughs> and and I do have a similar um, a similar diversification in the technology sector, where I do have shares of Texas Instrument, which. Uh, is a chip maker. I have Microsoft, which is more about cloud, artificial intelligence, and software. I do have Apple, which are making more devices such as the iPhone, um, the ta their tablets, and their MacBook. And on in another portfolio, and this is what put the um, the overweight to twenty six is my investment in Constellation Software, which is. A, a grow by acquisition company. It's it's almost like a financial stock, but geared towards like technology companies, but because mm -hmm. they're acquiring so many. So again, imagine that we have a big impact with artificial intelligence and all those stocks are crumbling because whatever, it's 
the, the AI is, is broken. So then Microsoft would be affected a little bit, but Constellation Software would not be affected. Um, Texas Instrument, not that much. And Apple, not really as well. So so then we have like one stock that would be affected. The other one would be quite independent. And that's the beauty of, of knowing exactly what you have in your portfolio. So it's one thing to have the sector allocation. And then sometimes we can argue, for example, if Visa should be in the tech stock or mm-hmm. maybe consumer uh, discretionary because it goes a lot with like as much people want to spend on their card or if it's a financial stock. I mean, we could debate on that for a long time, or we could just say, okay, so right now it's put in the financial, that's fine, but am I diversified within that sector? And if the answer is yes, well, then you can move on. So in terms of sector, I'm not that worried. If if I had only my pension account, I would definitely trim some um, some position from the financial and the technology stock sector because it it would be a bit too much to my taste to to have that much money invested in one uh, uh, in two sectors. But since I have other portfolios and the global view is better diversified, I'm still good at this point. Mike, I just want to add a small parenthesis here because uh, we wanted to use your pension plan for this episode to be as transparent as possible. And also because you share it publicly on uh, the dividendguyblog.com every month. But uh, what I'm noticing since we started is that basically you suggest investors to review their entire portfolios together, right? Um, yes, I found it's important to actually combine all portfolios that have the same goal. Um, so in a case where you invest for your retirement, if you have like four or five different accounts and you want to include your spouse account, for example, put them all together and then look at your asset allocation, then your sector allocation. And we're going to talk about stocks in a moment, but it makes a lot more sense this way because as you can see, if I just look at my pension plan, I should take action in terms of sector. But when I have the global portfolio where the, the entire goal here is to finance my retirement anyway, mm-hmm. there's no need to sell some financial stocks where on uh, in other portfolio, I'm o- underweight. So it allows you to do a little bit more of tax optimization as well, depending on the type of account you may have like different types of stocks or asset. Mm -hmm. And when you put everything back to the global picture, it makes a lot more sense and and it's still well diversified. So definitely it's really important to have a global view and not just deal account by account because you may like duplicate the number of transaction and you're going to waste a lot of time for not much results. Hey, dividend growth investors, this is Vero. Mike is currently taking a sip of water, which gives us 10 seconds, and I literally mean 10 seconds to grow the podcast together. Go on Spotify or Apple Podcast, hit pause, and then under our logo, you'll see two very interesting buttons. One to subscribe, hit that subscribe button now, and then give us a five-star rating. You know, our goal is to help more investors just like you, so please spread the love. Thank you. All right. So then uh, after asset and sector allocation, a look at your holdings ratings will help you identify losers or companies that might be at risk. Based on that, which companies show red flags in your uh, pension plan? Um, Yeah. So once again, I'm a big fan of not looking at the stock performance, especially over a short period of time. So I'm not going to look at like which, what are my biggest winners and what are my biggest losers uh, since the beginning of the year? Uh, that could be just contextual. And for example, last year, I would have sold all my Apple and all my Microsoft because they were down like 25 and 30%, which would have been a crime. Literally, mm-hmm. I should mm-hmm. go to jail if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that's the thing. I mean, this year they're among my top winners. So again, completely irrelevant in both ways. So what I rather do is look at the prorating and the dividend safety score that we have at DSR. Of course, they're not perfect, and of course, I cannot take decisions 
just based on the scoring system. And if that's mm-hmm. valid for any types of scoring, if you look at like your financial firms that you follow or you have like your brokerage somewhere, you're going to also have ratings from analysts from that firm. And sometimes they will be right, sometimes they will be wrong. But what is important is if you find an analyst saying, oh, this stock, I really dislike it. It's a sell. There's a problem, this and that. The analyst, what he's making, and, and it's exactly what we're doing at DSR, is we're raising a red flag. So it's it's worth the time to look into it and do some digging to make sure maybe this red flag is like is 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 true. Maybe it's not true. Maybe it's in, like it sh- it will affect your portfolio. But that's the case. It's just say okay, so. What is being highlighted by those reports? Um, on my side, I do have uh, three companies that do not have super strong ratings. So I have like um, CAE and Disney uh, that definitely are, they don't have a good dividend safety score. I don't have to, to tell you that. I mean, they <laughs> have suspended their dividend three years ago and they have never... <laughs> reinstated it. Uh, mm-hmm. Just keep in mind, at the time of recording, we are November 29th and Disney is expected to declare a dividend. So maybe by the time you listen to that, they're going to be a dividend announced because this is what Ooh. they said at the beginning of the year, but it's <laughs> not there yet. So right now it's flashing red in my portfolio. I don't like that. So those two are on my, I would say, upsetting list. <laughs> and another one that doesn't have like a super strong uh, metrics, a uh, super strong rating is Magna International with a uh, rating of a buy, so four out of five, which is pretty good, but dividend safety score of three, uh, just because the, the dividend growth rate have uh, reduced in 23. We don't expect a huge dividend increase in 24, but there will be one. Um, so this one is not necessarily a, a bad stock, but it definitely requires me to look at it a little bit more and to make sure I monitor every single quarter. This is what I did actually this year. And the last two quarters were actually a lot better. They We saw some margin expansion. So that helped me breathe. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm probably going to keep this one for another year. Uh, there's no urgency in trading this one, but I'm getting close to have to make a decision around uh, CAE and Disney. But Mike, since you have followed them quarterly all year, like you just said, these are not big surprises to you. So do you still review your investment thesis and dig further into the numbers? Or is your analysis pretty much a copy and paste of the previous quarters? Um, It's getting clearer and clearer, actually, because I've... um... When I started 23, I already determined that CAE and Disney must be sold if they don't start paying a dividend. And that was like my comment on in my portfolio, I think back in January or February of 2023. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the time at the end of the year, it's the time to revise the investment thesis. So that's the narrative, the story that you tell yourself about a stock, why you like it so much versus the real numbers. Because if the numbers are not backing up your story well then you're in fairy tale mode and that's very dangerous and and this is what's happening with both companies and this is what i i said i will do i will sell them if there's no dividend and in the next coming days this is exactly what's going to happen <laughs> and i find it very interesting this year because those are very upsetting decision for me in a sense that i really like those two companies and i still believe in my investment thesis, but I must admit that the divid- the numbers are not there. And at one point, I it's more important to follow the process than to be attached to one or two stocks that you really like and you want to drag further and further. I mean, I've been waiting three years for mm-hmm. a dividend to be paid. It's more than enough. So unfortunately, even if deep down, I believe that both companies will do well in the future. And it's kind of like ironic because I am making money on CAE. I'm still in positive side. So when I'm going to sell, I'm going to cash a profit. Not going to be the case with Disney. So I have two companies that one is a winner, one is a loser, and I'm going to sell both. But based on the principle of my divin- my investment strategy, I focus on dividend growers. There's no, there's not even a dividend, so let, let alone no <laughs> dividend growth. And 
And one thing I realized that was kind of interesting here is I looked at the weight of those two companies in my portfolio and Disney is 2.5% and CAE is also 2.5% of my portfolio right now. So why would I spend so much time debating to keep or not or to revise and monitor and postpone the decision for 5% of my portfolio? And that is just the pension plan. If I put that across all my other portfolios, those are like among my smallest position. So what's the point of debating and spending so much energy and time to, to talk about a stock that in the end will not move the needle one way or another? So the decision comes clear at this point where I'm just going to say, you know what, I'm going to sell both. I'm going to clean up my portfolio and I'm going to move on. So then mm -hmm. I will clear up my mind. I will get rid of the doubt. And this is what I mean by cutting off the noise. Right now, Disney and CAE has been creating more noise than anything else in my portfolio. So it's about time that I shut that door and I move on. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, now, dividend diversification is another important part of a portfolio, especially for retirees. Relying on a single stock to get like 10% of your total dividend income is risky. Do you have to trim some positions because of that? Um, where I am right now in my investing journey, I don't need to be that careful with the dividend diversification mm -hmm. um, because I'm not retired. So I don't count on that portfolio to generate income. When I look at the dividend diversification, and this is like one thing that I love about the DSO Pro dashboard. Right. Is I have this pie chart where I see my top 15 largest dividend payer. So not in terms of how much I invest in it and what's the value, but rather the value of their dividend paid. So even if, for example, uh, National Bank is, uh, let me see, where is it? It's like my seventh position, largest position, roughly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's my ninth largest stock. But in terms of dividend diversification, it's my most generous. Hmm. So it's like almost 11% of my dividend income for that portfolio, followed by Brookfield Corporation um, at another 10% and then Fortis at 9%. And, and those companies are not part of my top five largest holdings. So it just shows you the difference between the dividend diversification and the stock allocation. As a retiree, I think both are super important. So one for the value that you invest. So you need to look at the weight of each stock. And I'm going to get there in a moment for my portfolio, which is more important than the dividend diversification. But if you intend to withdraw $30,000 a year from your portfolio and it's all supposed to be dividend payment, you certainly don't want to generate $20,000 out of 30 from one company. Because mm -hmm. then if that company fails you, your entire retirement plan goes to waste. And, and this is why it's important to have, like, like in this case, for example, when I look at my portfolio, the, the largest position, the largest dividend payer is like 11%, and then it goes to 10 and 9 and 8 very quickly. So it's well diversified, and I don't have to worry about it too much. On the other side, I do have to look at the weight of each stock value in my portfolio, especially because I focus on a lot of low-yield, high-growth stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, my top three positions are Kushtar, with as 12% uh, of my portfolio, Microsoft with another 12%, and Apple with 8.4%. And when I put and again. That could seem like crazy numbers, but then I have to put that in a global view because I do have shares of Kushtard uh, across other... Uh, uh, actually, I do have shares of Kushtard, Microsoft, and Apple in other portfolios. But when I look at the global view, then it's completely different. I have my largest holding across all my portfolios is Apple with 12% of all my assets. And then mm -hmm. I have... Alimentation Kushtar at 10, and then Microsoft becomes a solid asset, but not like overweight at 6.84. But the thing is, I've I've set myself a limit uh, of 10% of my portfolio for one stock. 
And and the idea here is to limit the exposure of risk and not necessarily to debate if uh, Kushtar, Microsoft, or Apple are great companies or not. They're obviously great companies. I love them. And they are among my best winners. I want to let them run, but I don't want to get overrun by them. That's the difference. And at one point, if Apple crash and burns, that means that I put my portfolio at risk for losing 50% of my value in Apple, and that would be 6% of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's a bit too much to my taste, and I want to reduce that. So I'm going to trim some shares of Apple, probably like a good 3%. I'm going to do the same thing with Kushtard, maybe 2%, because I don't want to be overweight. So now I'm like a slightly above 10%. Uh, and by the way it goes, it will likely continue to perform very well. So I'm just going to trim it a little bit, 1% or 2%, just to tweak it again some rebalancement. And I don't think I'm going to touch Microsoft that much. At 684, it's a big position, but it's not the end of the world. I could let this one run a little bit more. Okay. So Mike, in summary, what do you think went good and what went bad for your portfolio? Um, what went good is patience. <laughs> uh, I just the fact that I, I I followed my strategy and I didn't do much. I mean, at the beginning of twenty three, I expected a tough year, so I did some cleanup. I did my spring cleaning, like selling and bridge, for example, which was a pretty good move. But sticking to my strategy was the most important part. Where now. Most of my low yield, high growth stocks that we have discussed today did very, very well, and that pushed my portfolio higher. And and this this also explains why my portfolio is doing better than the market is is mostly because of my top three stocks that did incredibly well in that pension plan. And and yeah, so that was more about being heavily invested in tech stocks that help and following my my strategy, not trying to reinvent the wheel here or do major the major transaction, but rather keep the same course, analyzing my portfolio every quarter. And that, that was quite a success this year. And Mike, uh, like you said at the beginning of this episode, the yearly update is the perfect timing to act. You kind of already answered that. So your decisions, if I remember correctly, will be to sell Disney, sell CAE, trim um, Alimentation Couchetard and Apple. Is that it? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's pretty, that's a lot, I think <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of selling. Uh, but yeah, it's about, and, and it's kind of interesting because when you look at it from a stock perspective, that is like four companies out of like 19 that I have where I'm going to mm -hmm. make transaction, which is pretty sizable. But in the end, uh, Disney and CAE, that's 5% of my portfolio. And I'm going to trim roughly another 5% of Apple and, and Alimentation Couchetard. So it's about 10% of my portfolio that will be reshuffled elsewhere. So it's it's major, but it's mostly because Couchetard and Apple did so great this year. And, and actually, uh, Couchetard did well last year while the rest of the portfolio was down. So that explains why it it is now such a big part of uh, the pension plan. Mm -hmm. And what will you do with the proceeds of your sales? Which stocks would you like to buy? That is a very good question. I And I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that I don't know yet. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, the thing is, I know that I will have the time to reflect during the holidays, but we're not there yet at the time of the recording. Mm -hmm. So that's the downside, I'd say, uh, to record a little bit in advance. But between you and me, dear listeners, uh, I'd rather have Vero take two weeks off during the holidays and get good rest than, try, than, than be forced to record an episode at the end of <laughs> December between uh, between two parties, right? So that's why we do it a month in advance. Um, so I'm, I can tell you about the process, though. The first thing I will do is I will look at my uh, at the sector allocation, and I will identify a sector that I'm not overweight. So definitely, mm -hmm. it will not. I'm not going to search for something in the financial or the technology sector. Uh, but besides that, all doors are open. I'm going to focus on a company with a very strong dividend triangle, especially because I don't expect. 24 to be such a nice ride either. I think we're going to continue to suffer from the lagging impact of higher interest rates across the board. Uh, so it, it 
it I don't expect it to be uh, a, an, an easy time for investors. So I, my focus will be on quality. Um, in 23, two stocks that I have added was uh, three stocks I have added was um, Costco. Uh, Home Depot and um, CCL Industries. Mm-hmm. So though it will be along those lines. Though probably a low yield, high growth stock with a very solid balance sheet with a lot of growth vectors. Uh, probably two stocks to have like 5% into each because I'm selling about for 10% of value. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will try to keep it like, yeah, I'm, I'm like the balance happens to be Nice because I have about five percent to trim on the U.S. side, and another five percent on the Canadian side. So I'll have two decisions to make: one Canadian, one U.S. I could tell you that I kind of like Stella Jones a lot, uh, but I haven't made my mind yet. I want to make sure that I want to reflect on that. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to work on a short buy list using the stock screener, focusing on the dividend triangle and making sure that I'm not overweight in a specific sector. And then I'm going to pull the trigger. All of that will happen toward the end of December or at the very beginning of January, because mid January I'll be in Argentina and it will be too late to take, to to make trades. My mind will not be there and I will uh, rather focus on a nice uh, glass of red wine instead. (laughs) And probably a soccer game, right? (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. So see, I'm already uh, scrapping my goal of having one cheat day a week in advance. So I don't know how, how this is going to end. It's not looking good. It's not looking good. All right. So I'll try to do a follow up on your future buys, uh, Mike. And to end this episode, do you have any portfolio goals for 2024? Um, I don't have any goals specifically because, again, I have a long-term mindset, so I don't really care what's going to happen next year. What I, it's and it's it's pretty much like when you drive and and I keep thinking about that because now I'm teaching my daughter how to drive and that's what I told her. I'm like, you know, when you take a curve, if you keep fixing the front of your car, you're you're going to make erratic movements and mm-hmm. you're going to have like a narrow vision. You're going to um, not see everything that happens around you. So n- you need to look at the horizon and at the at the end of the curve. So that's this is where I think we are entering into a curve into 24, where a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty will still be around. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to discuss those teams actually in our uh, in our first uh, week of January on the on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So. It's, it's really important to have that long-term mindset. So whatever happens in 24, I don't really mind because when I look at my portfolio, I always make sure that I have high quality companies. And this is the reason why I'm doing some selling and some trimming every year is to ensure that everything I have in my portfolio, I'm 100% happy with it. All right. Thank you, Mike, for being so transparent about your portfolio. Investors, a yearly update is a good way to stop waiting and act. I hope that this episode has given you the confidence you need to do so. Next week, we start a How to Invest in 2024 series. For this special event, we will release an episode a day from January 1st to January 5th. Do not miss the opportunity to start the year on the right foot by subscribing to the show now. For the show notes and related content, hit thedividendguyblog.com slash 154. Until next week, stay Stay invested. invested. Hey fellow investors, it's Mike here. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. Please note that the Dividend Guy blog podcast is at no time issuing buy or sell recommendation. Please do your own due diligence as this podcast is recorded for information and hopefully fun purposes only. Uh, Make your research, make sure you do your stuff. We're not responsible for your losses or your profit after listening to this episode. And until next one, stay invested. How much do you think you're paying in subscriptions every month? The answer is probably more than you think. Over 74% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you'll have a clear view of your subscriptions, and if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. They'll even try to negotiate lower bills for you by up to 20%. 
Just submit a picture of your bill and they'll take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash help me save. That's rocketmoney.com slash help me save. Rocketmoney.com slash help me save. You love podcasts, the stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.